me, and um, I'll give you a short, brief intro into uh, these two concepts of quantization and categorification. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and these are very deep uh, and important tools. We don't understand fully what these programs are. Many people are working on each of them. And to be honest, giving proper introduction into each of categorification and quantization would be a huge course of its own. So it would normally last for the whole year. As we know, introduction to quantum mechanics, for example, takes a whole year. And uh, I guess categorification is just about the same. So I have a very tough job of first uh, giving you a glimpse of what these are. And moreover, in some practical context where you can actually do some computations. But another thing which makes my job even tougher is that I want to show you the interrelation of how these two interact with each other. Because that's what this mini course is all about. Now, both of these words, quantum and uh, categorification or homological, played a role on several subjects and actually transformed the way we view uh, several areas of mathematics. And most prominently, I think that uh, these two had most interesting applications in representation theory. That's one of them. In this uh, context, my friend Roman Bezorkovnikov likes to say that categorification is essentially geometrization. So you're finding a uh, geometrical context for algebraic problem. And in this case, categorification is basically what leads to uh, geometric representation theory. So another context where these two words have perhaps the most profound application besides representation theory is uh, low dimensional topology. And here the word quantum appears a lot. And Even sometimes the whole branch is called uh, quantum topology, the whole area, because uh, it deals a lot with uh, certain quantum invariants. And we'll touch exactly this subject in this course, because after all, this school is called School on uh, Topology and Field Theory. So if I had to make a choice between these two sorts of applications, of course, I would choose the latter to be uh, in the framework of our general discussion in this school. And Another reason that if I had such a choice, I would focus on the layer because it's very concrete. So many of the concepts, abstract concepts that we'll be discussing today can be, and uh, the following days, can be easily checked in lots of concrete and practical examples. So, oh, uh, I see the one, the one below. Now I have to reconnect the line. OK. So <clears throat> there are many concrete examples. And for us, they'll be coming from nodes. So we'll talk about node invariants. And very often in this discussion throughout these four lectures, I'll be phrasing various problems where I'll try to uh, distinguish nodes or approach the problem as if I'm a low dimensional topologist. But this is just a mirage. It's not actually my motivation. My motivation is really to understand these concepts of quantization and categorification and try to explain them at basic uh, concrete level of these examples. So these examples provide for me just an arena, a playground where these concepts could be tested and made concrete and very practical, perhaps, with uh, applications of trying to classify knots and so on and so forth. So. <coughs> This, this will be basically sources of uh, lots of examples coming, coming from nodes. And um, I guess I should perhaps show you a couple of them. So this is the simplest knot with, as you would say, three crossings, which is called trefoil knot. 
in Rolfson's classification, which lists knots by number of crossings. This is the first knot with three crossings, so notation is 3-1. And as we go along, I'll show you more examples, and I'll <coughs> show you uh, examples of simple knots, such as this guy. This will be our basic example. And I'll show you complicated ones, which are actually hard to distinguish. Now, even though my aim is not really to talk about representation theory in detail, as I say, it's hard to do justice even to one subject uh, in four lectures. But I want to point out that these two are actually closely connected. And the way you can approach such a connection, or if somebody tells you, uh, talks about, say, low dimensional topology, you can always ask a question, what about the unknot? So unknot is the simplest possible knot. And we just unknotted circle embedded in a three-dimensional space. And in quantum topology, people usually study various invariants of knots colored by extra data. And this extra data often has to do with representation theory or group theory of some sort. So in particular, we'll be talking about knots colored by Lie groups or Lie algebras. <coughs> G for me will be the group, and uh, this little script G will be the Lie algebra of capital G, and uh, its representation, which I'll often call R. So the problems that arise in quantum topology or low dimensional topology associated with this knot problems often are interesting mixed combinations of topology because they involve uh, non-trivial ways how they, the knots can be knotted in three-dimensional space, or we'll talk about three manifolds in a moment. And on the other hand, they also involved representation theoretic data because some of these topological pieces will be naturally colored or decorated with data of groups and representations. So if you take topology away, for example, if you reduce interesting knotted circle to the most boring one, topology goes away and what you're left with? Representation theory. So that's how uh, this class of problems coming from low dimensional topology can actually feed back. And some of what I'm saying, not explicitly, but uh, very quickly can be made, uh, I can make a contact with the representation theory just by asking question, what happens in this case for the unknot? And again, I'll show you simplest instances, instances of this in a moment, but uh, you may keep it on the background, maybe for future uh, courses you'll see connection uh, more and more between this, these two subjects. And finally, uh, to finish this kind of foreword or um, introduction into what will happen next, I want to point out that uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any point, ask questions. If there is something which is unclear, um, it may be my fault or maybe this is indeed a deep question on the subject, and to some of these questions I may not have an answer. But in any case, feel free to ask, and this will help us to make this more interactive and more productive, of course. So any questions already at this stage or about the general plan or logistics? Just, just a comment when asking questions it would be helpful if you could repeat the question for the taping. Sure. I'll I realize that's hard. Right, right. I'll certainly try to do that. Okay, any other questions? So, in that case, the way many problems for us will be formulated is the following. So if I'm motivated by low dimensional topology, or in particular understanding knot invariance, then my starting point will often be a knot, such as this uh, knotted circle. Where I, again, I'm repeating the example of the trefoil. And um, as I say, we'll decorate <coughs> it with additional data of Lie group or Lie algebra and representation R. And to this data, one wants to associate various invariants. So this will be of completely different nature. Sometimes there'll be numbers, sometimes there'll be functions or even vector spaces. And our goal will be to understand 
all these sorts of invariants. In fact, uh, in some sense, my job will be to describe to the invariants which seem to be as far from each other as possible. So then we'll try to make connections, and that will be the exciting part. But in the what by now is considered conventional quantum topology, one associates to this particular data with this extra decoration, which is again not just topology, it also has a little bit of group theory. One associates so-called quantum group invariants. And as the name suggests, they have something to do with quantization. And I'm not going to give you the standard introduction to quantum group invariants. In fact, I'll give you a very unorthodox introduction into quantum group invariants. We'll come to them, but from a completely different angle. So it will be quite a surprise when this will happen, probably tomorrow or the day after. <coughs> but I guess I have to say at least a few words so we know what we're talking about. And the simplest examples, which I'll mention just briefly, come from basic choices were uh, GSSLN, for instance, of Cartan type A, <coughs> the simplest non-abelian Lie algebra, and R is the fundamental n-dimensional representation Also, using the sure wild duality, sometimes it's convenient to label representations by young tableaus or partitions. And uh, what we'll do, I'll, I'll explain maybe why people often do this uh, a little later, but just to introduce notation and get in the habit of using these notations, this will correspond to a partition which is or young tableau which consists of a single box. And this for me will denote the <coughs> fundamental and dimensional representation of SLN. If I want to take, say, symmetric powers of this representation, we'll be adding boxes in a row. If we want to make <coughs> anti-symmetric powers, we'll be adding boxes in the column. So to this choice, very special choice of SLN and fundamental representation, one associates invariant, which sometimes is denoted PN of Q, this is so-called quantum SLN invariant. And just as generic choices of Lie algebra in representation could produce very interesting knot invariants um, defined through quantum R matrix and uh, solutions to young Baxter equations and things like this, this certainly can be also defined as such. But the reason I chose, made this very special choice of SLN for the group of algebra and uh, this particular representation is that in this case, it's convenient or easy to define this invariance by a simple combinatorial rule called the Skane relation. So let me. Oh, again, yes. Thank you. So. In this case, um, Pn of Q can be defined via Skane relation, and it has the following form. Basically, it relates not diagrams, uh, which are planar diagrams of the knot um, related by very simple moves or changes of topology where if you see for oriented knot this type of crossing, you can replace it by another type of crossing where now the other strand goes on top. And the difference between two such terms or knots where you What's understood is that the rest of the <coughs> knot diagram is left unchanged under this operation. Uh, so the relation between these three diagrams is uh, as follows, where Q is a formal variable. For now, this is just a uh, formal variable and parameter. And as a result, what you find, or I should have said this before, you're aiming to define 
a polynomial, not invariant, or often Laurent polynomial. So this will be Z of Q and Q inverse in um, taking values in Z of Q and Q inverse. And again, Q is a formal variable. P is this not invariant that we're trying to define called quantum SLN invariant. And this is the simple rule uh, to obtain them in this particular case. Now, you also need an uh, initial starting point because by using sequence of such moves, you can reduce um, any node diagram such as this one or more complicated ones to very simple um, unknotted loops, again called the unknots. And therefore, you need the definition of what Pn is for, for this unknot or equivalently for, sometimes I'll literally draw it, sometimes I'll just write the unknot. But in any case, you need uh, to specify what this is. And here there are several choices, in fact. Uh, all of them are natural for different reasons. And as we go along, you'll probably see more and more uh, why one choice is better for one thing and the other is better for another thing. But the two standard ones involve the following. One is, for instance, if uh, you set the value of this invariant for the n naught to be q to the n minus q to the minus n divided by q minus q inverse. Of course, you can divide the numerator by the denominator. And what this ends up being is q to the power minus n minus 1 plus and so on. And then it goes up to plus n minus 1. So in total, there are n terms here in this, in this sum. And they have an obvious property that if q goes to 1, which is what we'll sometimes consider classical limit, so as q goes to 1, this whole sum goes to n, of course, because there are just n terms. And this is in the sense in which you could declare that this n terms, which you see in this definition, or equivalently this ratio of q to the n minus q to the minus n divided by q minus q inverse, is what's sometimes called a quantum dimension of your representation r. In the present case, uh, we take fundamental and dimensional representation, and quantum dimension of it is exactly uh, this combination here. Yes? It looks like more than n. Yeah. More than n. Um, well, if, if n is 2, it should be 2, right? And then that's 2. So. Two in the yeah, you skip, you skip uh, the step here is 2. So if I, if I wrote the next term, it would have actually made it easier. So this is n minus 1. The next lower degree uh, would be, assuming n is positive, would be n minus 3, actually. So the step in this sum is 2. So this is sum of all the terms um, of powers of q, which range from minus this to plus this, but with a step 2. OK, that's, that's a very good question. So let me show you an example. But I was actually hoping to suggest this as a homework. Because for some of you, and, and again, that's, that's where I say this is a very concrete subject. So lots of things can be tested. But it only makes sense if you actually make that list a little effort and really try to test or make, make some experiments. So I promise you more interesting surprises. But uh, what you suggested, I, I'll show you the beginning of the calculation. And then I'll ask you in the homework to complete it, in fact. So uh, since you asked, let me maybe start with this, and then I'll continue with normalization. So how could you try to use this um, in practice? For this, I guess I should draw a slightly bigger knot. <coughs> OK. Or actually, uh, you know what? Let me introduce yet another example, which will be so I'll, th this one is called trefoil. 
and that will be my one of the basic examples. Another basic example that we'll use sometimes, and now is a perfect time, is the so-called Hopfling. Mostly I'll talk about knots, and knots are essentially, by definition, links with only one component, but you may imagine several embedded circles in three-dimensional space which are linked in a non-trivial way. And the simplest one is, uh, let's see, is the Hopfling. So that's what it is. It consists of two circles, <coughs> two rings sitting like this. So that's the name for it. And it's a two component link. And the idea is that if I give orientation to the strands, which I'll often do, like this for instance, so orientation continues and goes as here. I can now start using uh, this skein relations trying to evaluate a uh, polynomial invariant for this particular knot or link, whatever uh, nature gives to me. So if it hands to me the Hopf link, what I would do is the following. I would say that uh, PM that I'm trying to compute here of this fellow can be expressed via combinations <coughs> like this and like this, where I apply the skein relation to one particular crossing. So suppose, for instance, I pick the top one, this one here. So let's see what happens. So the meaning of the skein relation is that I'm changing only the single crossing, the one which I decided to work on, and leave the rest of the diagram completely unchanged. So to draw it a little bit uh, larger, um, first, um, if I apply this skin relation on the top crossing, what will happen is that I'll produce a diagram like this. And now you see it's uh, completely unknotted. This will be obtained by changing the type of crossing where strand which was going below is now going on top. And now I have another term in the skin relation which just moves the strands apart and reconnects them in a different way. So let's see what this would give us. In this particular case, the second term or the term on the right-hand side will be the bottom will be unchanged. But here, what will happen is this, okay? And now you see what happens is that already with a single application of this combinatorial rule, the scan relation, we reduce interesting link, which is this half link, to combination of two unlinked circles because now one goes completely below the other one and I can just separate them. So these are two separate unlinked circles. And this is a single guy. So there are in some sense, uh, both of these are combinations of the unknot, perhaps several copies. And this is actually what you find in general. If you start applying the skin relations, uh, if you do sequence of moves like this, um, you very quickly end up with simpler knots, which you already computed, so you can try to do this recursively, so to say. And if the knot is, or link is very simple, such as Hopf link or the trefoil, you immediately end up with something trivial. Yes? Did you say what happens if you have like k copies of the knot? Right, I was going to say this, right. So the only thing you have to know, indeed, is um, if you end up with more than one component. So then, in general, all of this invariance that I'm going to tell you about behave in the following way. So first of all, P of unknot added to um, some knot k will be product of the polynomial for the unknot and for the other knot k. And in fact, more generally, and I should remember to bring the other board up. So more generally, If you have disjoint union of two components of link, say K1 and K2, you can think of them as two knots which don't talk to each other at all. This is just the product of the corresponding invariant for uh, 
k1 and k2. So you just multiply them. Okay. So this is this is what happens. Yeah. Uh, the question was, what happens if we flip orientation? So I want to relegate this question for later. So uh, in some cases, what happens is that Q goes to Q inverse. Uh, but it actually depends on what kind of knot invariance we're considering. So in each case, I'll, I'll say it separately and more carefully. For some of them, it actually doesn't matter what orientation is. Uh, for some, it does. And that's why at this, so I'm starting with sort of say the zeroth level. Then we'll come back to this later and later. So um, we'll revisit sometimes the same invariant twice. And in the first run, I'll definitely suppress such, such issues. And, and then later on, we'll be more careful. This, for example, applies to more or less any knot invariant that we'll be discussing. We'll be discussing many of them, and this holds quite generally, for reasons which have, which directly follow from rules of TQFT, and um, we'll, we'll touch a little bit this, um, of this later. But orientation is definitely dependent on which case we have. Okay, any, any other questions? So let me come back to... So are yeah. we also going to discuss what happens if you do a reflection in ambient space? Yes, yes, that's, that's the same question. So there are two, it's a different, right, it's a different question, uh, but there are two issues, orientation of the knot and orientation of the ambient space. And we'll discuss both, yes. At least uh, in, in cases where it will be important, so. <clears throat> okay, so. Now, I want to point out that, which already, story it's saying essentially actually let me use maybe this blackboard normally I prefer to be uh, very organized and just go in sequence of blackboards one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So here I have to go a little bit out of order because I'm giving you the definition of this quantum SLN invariant in terms of skin relations. And since I already put, so what I'm trying to emphasize, there are basically two or three essential rules. The most interesting one, of course, is this one here, which says what happens if you try to change crossing. This one says, about initial starting point for this recursive procedure. And then you asked a very good question. In fact, um, these sorts of questions, uh, what happens if you get more than one component? But I want to come back to the second point here, and that's why I'm going a little bit out of order as far as using the blackboards, because um, I want to give you a word of caution. that this, this whole subject um, comes with a grain of soul and um, sometimes there are several different normalizations that people use. Or actually, you know, uh, let me relegate this uh, for a second and, and still use this blackboard, but for even yet another more important point, perhaps. So I want to make a remark once we're at this. I want to say that in this example, which, which I'm showing you, this is the only kind of first look at quantum invariant, and then we'll leave this quantum world and start from something very, very classical. Uh, I want to point out something really neat and pretty cool, that in this definition of quantum SLN invariant, dependence on n appears only by this combination q to the power n. Okay. So our initial choice here involves q to the power n. And also the recursive, most important recursive step in this procedure also involves q to the power n. So instead of using or keeping track of q dependence of this knot invariant, as well as n dependence, we can try to recombine this uh, operation and trade 
information about Q and N for Q and what I'll call A, Q to the power N. Okay. So if we do that, then we can actually rewrite this relation in the following form. The first one becomes A times P of A and Q minus A inverse times P of A and Q. Um, here, I mean, for, for, for these particular crossings that we have. To avoid clutter, I decided to focus on the diagrams, but of course now this P is also um, depends on both Q and A. Okay? Now, this is what happens if I do this trade-off at the first rule. The second rule, which says the initial value of P for the on mod is in this language, A minus A inverse divided by Q minus Q inverse. In fact, what these rules are, these rules are for the scaling relations for another polynomial um, not invariant called the Humphrey polynomial. Namely, the object P of A and Q constructed by this rule is um, called Humphrey polynomial and can be defined via this uh, combinatorial rule. Right, it's uh, probably not proper to call it polynomial anymore. Uh, this is standard terminology used in the literature and In general, of course, it will involve denominators like this, inherited uh, from the fact that for general values of A, which have nothing to do with Q, now once we traded uh, N for A, uh, A may be treated as a separate variable. And of course, this is no longer divisible, at least not in a simple way. We lose connection to quantum group invariants because here we had this nice property that such dividing uh, numerator by denominator gave us quantum dimension of N, and that had actually contact with representation theory, and again, this is just a glimpse of it. There is way more to be said. But anyhow, once we do this trade-off, uh, no longer for, for A, uh, this is possible. However, this is still called polynomial in the literature, and I guess part of the motivation for this is, is the following, that if we specialize to, oops, A equals Q to the N, then the definition here gives us quantum SLN invariant that we started with. And this is clearly a polynomial. And after all, that was our starting point in deriving this, this more general version. Then there are several other interesting specializations included in the first one when A is equal to Q squared. Uh, the scaling relations or this combinatorial rule I'm giving you is actually the rule for defining rule for the so-called Jones polynomial, which is the father of such quantum group invariants. And the reason I'm starting with the general N, just to show you that the Jones polynomial fits very naturally into more general system of such polynomial invariants labeled by N. So you can actually do it for fundamental representation of any SLN. And then there is yet another interesting specialization, which I'll mention very briefly. If you set A equals one, then you'll get another classical not invariant, the so-called Alexander polynomial. <coughs> 
So see, in all of these specializations, many different reductions, when you lose, instead of two variables, you get back something which just involves a single variable, you get lots of polynomials. And I think that's roughly the reason why Homefly is also sometimes called polynomial, because it's encompassing all of these fellows together. Now, if you're alert, you'll probably notice that <coughs> setting a equals one is not such a great idea. Well, it makes the first relation very simple. It just says, oh, don't worry how, uh, you know, what coefficients you put in front of these crossings. But with the second uh, rule, which is initial step for the recursive procedure, uh, this is not so good to set A equals one. In fact, if we do this, we immediately kill the starting point and then everything will be zero. So that's uh, not so good. And it is actually related to this word of caution that I was trying to give you. So now it's unavoidable. Remark is such that um, there are two uh, standard normalizations used in the literature. Actually, there are several choices, and I want to discuss uh, all the important ones so that you don't get, uh, you can easily navigate through it later on. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more than what we need right now. So first of all, uh, as for value of the unknot, there are several natural choices, and well, they're all good for their own reasons. One which we already saw is where p of the unknot is a minus a inverse divided by q minus Q inverse at the level of Homfly, which is this two variable polynomial that we just introduced. Another nat natural choice is just to say P of the unknot is equal to one. After all, unknot is the simplest knot. You cannot reduce it any further. It has no crossing, no interesting topology. So why don't we just declare it to be equal to one? Well, this was more motivated by connection to groups and representation theory. In fact, this is just a character of n-dimensional representation for UQ of SLN. And um, this is more natural on any other grounds. So this is the simplest, reflecting the fact that unknot is the simplest knot. These two choices correspond to so-called unnormalized and normalized. definitions of the Homefly polynomial and all other polynomials that you get from them. Now, <coughs> the name comes from the following fact, this normalized versus unnormalized. If you think about this, the scan relation that relates different crossings is linear, so in P, right? Therefore, uh, I can divide or multiply all the P's here by some particular value, such as value of the unknot, for instance. And this is exactly what relates these two choices. So if you wish, at the level of polynomials, all of these guys that I described for you, you can obtain two versions of the Homfly that you get starting from this initial condition or this initial condition, simply by dividing the value of your unknot, uh, sorry, not, not Homfly polynomial by uh, this expression a minus a inverse divided by q minus q inverse. So then you get something that would you, what you would produce by using this as the initial starting point. Yeah. I thought I heard you say that uh, if you set a equal to one, then you get like you get zero for the unknot, but then you get zero for everything. Correct. On Correct. That word you wrote that a equals one gives Alexander polynomial. Exactly. Exactly. So therefore, right? You see that. Uh, Sometimes it's just a matter of normalization, but sometimes it matters. For instance, if you want to specialize to A equals one, you should only use this so-called normalized version. That's just a fact of life. So if you start with this and go ahead and do computations, uh, you'll produce something which will have nice limit as A goes to one. It won't vanish, it won't. 
But if you use this as initial step, you'll get something which will automatically vanish for kind of, kind of boring reason. And this is a good question and very good point. So here comes your first homework, so that you actually get in a habit and in practice see what's, what's going on. So this is, of course, homework just in codes. Uh, I'm not sure if you're planning to give out home official formal homeworks, but this is just useful exercise because I'll tell you the answer to this later anyway. Uh, it will be very instructive uh, if you actually go through the skin relations and compute the answer yourself because, A, first of all, when I'll start talking about something else, you'll recognize it much quicker, first of all, because you already there will be another instance from this homework where you would see the same answer. But secondly, it will help you to navigate a little bit better through these different normalizations. And you'll see that there is nothing to be scared of. It's just uh, very solid and uh, well-defined choices. You have to be a little bit careful. So there are these uh, cautious remarks, and I'll continue with this. But you'll see that it's, it's uh, not scary by looking at the following. So compute. Uh, normalized as well as unnormalized home free polynomial and by the way in one of the versions it does become polynomial even if uh, it's not obvious from the definition uh, for K, which is this simplest knot I'm showing to you all the time, the trefoil knot. Okay. So just go through this carefully yourself. Uh, see, I already started an exercise based on the Hopf link for you, which unfortunately I erased. But the idea is very simple. You start with this knot diagram. You try to change one crossing, apply the skein relation, and very quickly you'll see that you get either one copy or several copies of the unknotted circle. And then you have to use uh, either this or uh, the other normalization for the start. So then do this computation, play with this a little bit. By playing, I mean the following. For example, uh, look at specialize to A equals Q squared to get both versions to get normalized and unnormalized Jones polynomial. So again, there are two versions which differ by normalization. And as I said, Jones polynomial is essentially this quantum group invariant where capital N is equal to two. So it's defined by exactly this combinatorial relation. This is one of the definitions. So save these expressions that uh, you'll produce for later, because we'll, we'll see them later on. Yes? Sorry, so in the case that you have a link with many connected components, how does normalization affect it? Does the product still hold and serve? That's, that's a good question. I was, uh, when I was writing this, I was tacitly suppressing this, hoping that you would actually figure it out yourself. You'll, you'll have to run to these points, because you will produce several components. OK, I'll spill the bins and just say that uh, if you have several components, you're essentially normalizing only one of them. So that's an interesting point. But again, I strongly encourage you to go through this, because uh, it, it's much, it, it makes a difference to see it yourself as opposed to me telling you this. So. For Right, so for basically uh, what I'm saying here is that if you have k, if k is a knot with only one component, then <coughs> p uh, of k normalized is equal to p of k unnormalized divided by p of the unknot, also, of course, unnormalized. Okay. Essentially, this rule, 
means that, yeah, we are normalizing only a single component, but again, I, I encourage you to, to look at it carefully. Another thing which you'll uh, discover in doing this exercise, and for this I don't really have time right now, but it is very instructive. So do another specialization. This one will give you a, color, a Jones polynomial, and we'll come to this uh, later on. You'll actually recognize when it will appear on the board before I, I'm going to even say that if you do this computation, but from, from a different context. But another useful specialization is the following. Specialize both expressions, again, normalized and non-normalized, do them in parallel so you actually um, get a better handle on this problem, to uh, A equals Q. Okay? You'll find something nice. Okay? Try to explain. Or ask yourself a question, why you find something nice? Okay, so leaving that homework aside, let's go back to cautious remarks that I'm making here. And I have to make a few more. which belongs here, is that sometimes in the literature, people also use uh, slightly different conventions where powers of Q, and then if you work with this two-variable generalization, then also powers of A are scaled by a factor of two. And this is very annoying because literally half of the literature is in one set of conventions and another 50% in the other. So uh, you should watch out for things where there are definitions where A is replaced by square root of A compared to my conventions and Q is replaced by square root of Q. So all powers are halves of what I'm writing in, in uh, these conventions. And then another problem or something to watch for is that some people use A inverse for what I call A, and they also use Q inverse for what I call Q. And of course, you can have combinations of this, so, or both. And uh, this is something you have to really keep track of. Okay, any questions or? For this uh, homework assignment, uh, take any, actually. Uh, that, see, this subject is full of Z2 choices, which are a lot of fun, like, like this ones, and of course, in this case, is, uh, so trefoil is not the same as its mirror, so yes, choice of orientation will matter a little bit, but uh, it, it will be okay if some of you do one, the others do the other one. In fact, I was going to suggest if you feel if you already know much of this anyway, so some of you maybe have seen it before, uh, take slightly more complicated knot. I wouldn't suggest going beyond knots with eight crossings, but uh, uh, pick, pick a suitable for your strength example and you can go through this exercise. Um, Okay, so I'm about to leave the territory, uh, this, this uh, small, tiny intro into uh, actually quantum group invariance of nodes. And we're 
doing very well on time. So But as I say, sometimes I'll motivate the problems that we're studying from topology viewpoint, and I'll try to um, make a fool of myself by uh, drawing two knots, interesting ones, which are uh, give kind of topological motivation for, for studying this. So one knot is going to be a knot with five crossings, so hopefully it won't be too complicated. Let me give it a shot. Um, Let's see, does it make sense? One, two, three, four, five, five crossings. And uh, if none of the consecutive crossings can be easily disentangled, it means I didn't make a mistake. So this is not, which is called five one. The second one will be more challenging to draw, but I'll give it a try. All right, so let's see if this makes sense. This guy has lots of crossings. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is not ten, one, three, two. So again, the knots are organized by number of crossings. So the first bigger number says how many crossings there are, and the subscript is just a catalog number in the list of knots with that many crossings. So there are only two prime knots with five crossings, and this is first of them, called 5-1. But then there are lots of knots with uh, 10 crossings, and this is uh, knot 1032. Right, so I should probably uh, give you a name for this uh, catalog. It's called uh, Rolfson Table, Rolfson Classification. That's the one I'm using. And some of these knots have a special funny names, such as trefoil or unknot. Um, uh, this, I think, is sometimes called tweeny knot, if I remember correctly. Uh, but then, if you want to make sure you didn't make a mistake, say, in the homework, uh, I should probably also mention Bornatan's knot atlas. This is a uh, wiki-based database, which has lots of knot invariants. And some of the expressions that I'm asking you to compute are presented here. So this is online. And very user-friendly. But part of the reason of going through different notations conventions is that you'll see that uh, Bernatan, who created this uh, site and database, uses a particular set of conventions. And uh, for you to operate freely, 
uh, between different conventions, you, it, it's very useful to go through this at least once. So, in fact, if, if I made a mistake in drawing this 1032 knot, hopefully I didn't, but if I did, uh, the actual picture can be found right here. So why do I mention this pair? Because for these two knots, computing the invariance that we introduced today is not terribly easy. Uh, but it can be done. And uh, of course, it's much easier in this case than in trying to disentangle 10 crossings. But what you find is that all of this invariance that we introduced, starting with the most classical and the old one, oldest, which is the Alexander polynomial, they're exactly the same for these two guys. Okay. So as we know, these two are essentially special limits or contained in the Humphrey. So I could have said all of this simply by stating that uh, this Humphrey polynomial or unnormalized Humphrey power series is also the same for these two guys. Okay. So to a topologist, this gives motivation to work harder because uh, yes, we did produce very interesting not invariants defined in this case by skin relations, but, and they're strong. They, they allow to distinguish many knots. In fact, uh, in topology, the knots with 10 crossings or less are considered simple. So at least for simple knots, they go, do a pretty good job, but not good enough. So there are still some uh, knots left, which obviously look different. And I guess we can try to uh, pre reduce by pulling strands through each other, this one, this picture to this picture, but we'll see that it's not possible. And there are actually invariants which distinguish these two guys. We'll see this invariants uh, later in the very last lecture that I'm going to give to you. But for topologists, this is part of the motivation why we want to go further and upgrade uh, this invariants to something smarter, bigger, and find proper home for them. So I guess in view of time, I'll just stop at this point, and then we'll start with a new topic tomorrow. Yeah, so for the question again, it would be great if you could repeat them. Any questions? That last thing. That last thing that you just mentioned, um, will those invariants be classical? Or, um, or will they involve the title of your talk? They'll involve uh, the, the other part of the title of my talk. Uh, they'll be homological and categorical. But again, I'll try to, uh, th this is not, this mini course is not proper introduction into either quantization or categorification. It's an appetizer. I'll basically explain to you with hands-on approach what these things are, and I'll try to make them computable. Oh, I forgot to repeat the question. The question was uh, whether this will be classical or quantum, uh, the invariance we distinguish these guys. So, and then, so this is first uh, type of response. The second is that even quantum invariants, which are standard quantum group invariants, which I mentioned today, uh, will encounter and they'll emerge either next time or in the third lecture from a completely different angle. So they'll come as quantum invariants, but of a problem which looks very, very different. So in some sense, this is what makes current research on this very interesting and exciting because you start with a completely different looking problem and then you end up with the same, um, or with, with this invariance that could have been introduced by quantum groups, but one of the reasons why I'm not doing it systematically and not doing it this way, just giving you scan relations, which is just a shortcut, the, the simplest way to basically compute them, <laughs> is because we'll come to these guys by a different route. So that's, that's another reason why it will be quantum, but a different quantum. So there were two more questions, yeah. Oh, that's for names of the people uh, 
in here, and I want to be able to reproduce all the six names. So it's its abbreviation for the yes, first letters of the last names of people. Uh, yeah. What is uh, what is the quantum SLN variant have to do with SLN? What does quantum SLN invariant have to do with SLN? So that's, that's a great question. And this is, this is where I made this uh, painful choice of sacrificing a proper introduction to this. So a proper introduction into this quantum group invariants would have involved more group theory. <coughs> and, and, and then uh, what one, roughly one would try to do, one would associate a certain object to each crossing not a scan relation, this is just a substitute for something which is much more general and real. So for each crossing, one would associate so-called quantum group R matrix. And that depends on the choice of Lie algebra and representation in a crucial way. That's, that's the, where input data that we mentioned enters dramatically. And then we'll spend, we would spend most of the time studying properties of this quantum R matrix. It would satisfy young Baxter equations and things like that. That would, uh, in topology encode, write the master moves. And as a result, then we would basically take such ingredient R matrix for each crossing, and we would put them in certain particular order, essentially taking the trace. I mean, these are matrices in some space, so we would take the trace of several of them, one for each crossing. And the claim is we would have computed exactly the same invariant that we get in the shortcut definition. So that would have made it crystal clear that what we're doing is perhaps more group theory or representation theory than topology. This avoids it. And unfortunately, uh, from this viewpoint, it's, it's hard to see maybe besides some indications, such as this one here and similar ones, uh, that there is much left of group theory. But there is a connection. 